authority always wins. Steve hated conformity and constantly battled authority. He got into some trouble with the law twice, which was the reason we were separated. It was as if delusory devils were always nipping at his heels. Unconditional love was the only way to really understand Steve in the heart of his personality. In matters of love, choosing style over substance is disastrous. As handsome as he was, I appreciated him more as a man who wanted to change. But the only way to my heart was through my daughter, and only I knew that. Very slowly, our friendship was on the mend. I began to look forward to Steve's calls. Often, he called many times a day. Our conversations went long into the evenings. He expressed his sorrow about our breakup and how badly he wanted to be a father to Kira. Every day, he expressed how much he loved her and missed her. He also wrote and mailed love letters three to seven times a day. I loved his letters. They felt like daily gifts. He's tenacious, but is he telling the truth? I wondered if he was only telling me what I wanted to hear. I had a little girl to consider first, ahead of myself. I didn't need to carelessly toss around her life or emotions. My daughter came first. Ring, ring. I excitedly dashed for the phone. Sure, Steve was calling. I picked it up on the second ring, but it wasn't Steve. My father was on the other end of the line. His voice was solemn. Eric shot himself last night. He sighed despondently. My Eric? My cousin? I was shocked. My little cousin, whom I had lived with when I was a baby? Yes, he answered frankly. Dad and my cousin had just sliced open my Achilles heel. Oh my God, I can't take this anymore. I can't take any more of this madness. My father must have realized at that very moment that Eric's death would devastate me. Eric was my cousin, my family, and he committed suicide. I observably didn't take the news well. Eric was only 19 years old, and in a brief moment of young, lost love melancholy, he shot himself in the head. Oh, shoot, Amber, I'm so sorry. My father was expressing a strong pang of conscience. I assured him that I would be all right, and we hung up. I wept in my hands. Dirt poor, I didn't have the money to go to his funeral in Texas. I felt reduced and lowly. I couldn't even afford to comfort my Aunt Eleanor and hug her as she had consoled me when I was a toddler. I needed some cheering up. A special letter came in the mail. Inside was a picture that destroyed any doubt I had about Steve's love for my daughter, our daughter. It was a Polaroid picture of Steve flexing, show off. His bicep was taut and tightened, showing off his first and only tattoo. My heart started doing cartwheels. On his upper left arm was tattooed, Kira. He had tattooed her name on himself. We weren't even together. It was then that I knew he loved and considered Kira his daughter whether he was with me or not. This all struck our gargantuan, mushy, motherly cord within me. I'm coming to see you. Are you going to open your door to me? That was it. No more late phone calls into the night, ongoing apologies or questions. He would drive the 13 hours necessary to my dinky apartment. It was the moment of truth. He was ready to try again, but was I. There was a brief silence, mainly because I was teasing him. Maybe. I said in a coy tone and swiftly hung up the phone. Would he really drive here tonight? Should I really start over with him? At 1.30 a.m., I heard a light knocking on my front door. My heart jumped into my throat. It was Steve. He really did it. There he stood, exhausted, with suitcase in hand. Even wiped out after a 13-hour drive, he looked delectable. We hugged each other, stronger than we ever had before. Let me see your new tattoo. I asked with a smirk. Caution aside, we stayed fresh. The love that was never really lost filled my life again. He found a good job quickly, and we were all quite happy and content. 